All right, good to see all of you. <clears throat> Father, we come before you this morning looking at a parable that I confess I have spent years longing to preach here in depth. I know I've referenced it in numerous sermons, but it's been great to be able to dig into it over these weeks. And I think it's just incredible, Lord, the um, picture of justification. We have justification taught in such chapters as Romans 4 and, and Galatians 3, but to see such a vivid example of justification in the lives of, of two people and how one would be justified and the other wouldn't, I pray, Lord, that all of the great truths contained here can be revealed clearly to your people. I pray that we can appreciate justification by grace through faith, how we are and are not justified. I pray, Lord, we'd grow in our appreciation for Christ, for the gospel, for salvation, and, and really, I would say, what we bring to the table when saved, which is nothing, nothing more than the sin that we need to be saved from. I pray, Lord, for any unbelievers who have joined us this morning who haven't been justified, perhaps they still cling to their own righteousness, then this would be a, a great Sunday for them, uh, really a perfect one. And so I pray for them, Lord, that they would see their need for Christ, their need to be justified by grace through faith in him. You'd open their hearts to the gospel and save them, Lord. Help me to do justice to this wonderful parable. Just use me as your vessel. If there's anything that is not in my notes, you'd have me deliver to your people. Bring that to my, to my mind and then my mouth. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, good to see all of you. So the title of this morning's sermon is God Be Merciful to Me, a Sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. So Sunday mornings, we've been working our way through loose gospel verse by verse, and we find ourselves halfway through the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so last week, we looked in depth at the Pharisee, and this morning, we will be looking in depth at the tax collector. So if you want to hear the first half of the parable, if perhaps because you were not here last week, then go ahead and listen to last Sunday's sermon. So since we are going to be talking so much about tax collectors, or in particular a tax collector this morning, I want to make sure we understand tax collectors and why they are vi uh, viewed so poorly in Scripture. Because you probably know that numerous times, eight times to be exact, in the Synoptic Gospels, it says tax collectors and sinners, versus saying murderers and sinners, or adulterers and sinners. And so why is it written this way, as though being a tax collector is the worst sin imaginable? Because to the Jewish mind, what? It was, exactly. The Romans severely taxed the Jews, and the tax collectors who collected the taxes for Rome were Jews. And so the Jews hated the Romans, and the Jewish tax collectors who worked for them were traitors to their own people for their own personal gain. Tax collectors were wealthy, and it was a wealth that was made off the backs of their already severely oppressed Jewish brethren. Tax collectors had to, come out a, had to collect a certain amount for Rome, and anything that they collected above that, they were able to pocket for themselves. But even when Jews knew that they were being overly taxed by the Jewish tax collectors, they couldn't do anything about it because these Jewish tax collectors had the support of Rome, which allowed these tax collectors to essentially be thieves. Last week, we read about Levi, who was a tax collector. He became one of Jesus' disciples. His name was changed to Matthew, and then he is the author of the gospel bearing his name. Tax collectors were notoriously dishonest. You might remember when they came to be baptized by John, so they were convicted. He's performing a baptism of repentance, and so they come in repentance. And Luke 3, 12, they said to John, Teacher, what shall we do? And John said to them, John the Baptist said, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. That was the one thing he said to tax collectors because their primary sin that they needed to repent of was theft. With that in mind, look with me in verse 13. We get to see a tax collector here with a beautiful conviction. He stands afar off. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beats his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, there's so much to learn about this tax collector. 
just from this single verse that we're going to break it up part by part to look at each individual part about him. So first, I want you to notice that he's standing far off. Now I ask you questions, and I'm kind enough to let you know when it's a trick question, right? Well, I have a trick question for you. Did the tax collector want to approach God? Did this tax collector want to approach God? Well, you want to say yes, because as the parable begins, he went up to the temple to pray, but you want to say no because he stands far off. And so it really captures this beautiful tension or struggle that's taking place in his heart where he wants to have a relationship with the Lord, he wants to be in fellowship with him, but he recognizes this terrible sin in his life. So he draws near to the Lord because he wants a relationship with him, but he stays back because he feels so convicted over his sin. He's not worthy enough to approach the Lord. Second, notice it doesn't say the tax collector did not lift up his eyes to heaven. It says he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. So in this unworthiness, he, he feels so unworthy, he cannot even lift up his eyes to look at heaven where God himself dwells. Third, he's hitting himself, hitting his chest more than likely like this. And why would he do this? Why would he be hitting himself? Well, more than likely because he's angry about his sin. He knows that he's the source of it. So one of the really beautiful things we see with the tax collector is it's implied that he's not making any excuses for his sin. He does not hold anyone else responsible for it. He is angry with himself. He's beating himself because of the sin that he's committed. Why, in particular, would he be beating his breast, hitting his heart? Because he sees that as the place that his sin comes from. Matthew 15, 18, Jesus said, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is what defiles a person for out of the heart, listen to this, out of the heart, pretty much every ugly thing you can imagine, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And so he beats his heart over this, recognizing it as the source of his sin. Now, I want to tell you something interesting. There's only one other place in all of Scripture that mentions people beating their breasts or doing what we see the tax collector doing here, and it's immediately after Jesus died. So if you want to mark your spot in Luke 18 and turn to Luke 23, verse 46, I'll go through these verses quickly. This is the only other place in Scripture we see people beat their breast as the tax collector did. Luke 23, 46, Jesus calling out with a loud voice, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then having said this, he breathed his last. And now go ahead and skip to verse 48. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. Now, give me your attention. Whenever we read Scripture, we want Scripture to interpret Scripture. Or another way to say it is, we want the Bible to be the commentary on the Bible. So if we're ever trying to interpret a verse... We look at a similar verse elsewhere in Scripture. If we're trying to interpret an event or situation or action, we look for that same event or situation or action elsewhere in Scripture to interpret the event or action that we're trying to understand. Now, in this situation, if we consider why these people were beating their breasts after Jesus died, it helps us understand why the tax collector was doing the same thing. And let me just read part of what John MacArthur said in his sermon about this. There has never been a more horrific event than the cross. Therefore, there could never be a place of more profound anguish than the cross. And men and women who were there to see Christ's death reacted in this dramatic way. So here is the tax collector doing a gesture that demonstrates the same extreme anguish. Or here's another way to say it. 
the tax collector demonstrated the same extreme anguish over his sin that we see people experiencing over Jesus' death on the cross. And so I do not think that it would be too much to say that there is nobody in Scripture shown to experience as much grief over sin as this tax collector. Now, in the last sermon, I told you that when Jesus began this parable, he uses a Pharisee and a tax collector because they serve as bookends or, uh, on human morality. They're polar opposites. That There could be nobody who looked more different from each other than these two. The Pharisee is the most righteous, respected man that Jesus could portray. The tax collector, the most sinful, despised man that Jesus could portray. Well, their differences continue with their actions. Now that we understand the Pharisee from last week and are developing an understanding of the tax collector, I just want you to notice how oppositely their actions look from each other. Even though we're not told where the Pharisee, well, let me just ask this. We're not told where the Pharisee stood, but you get the impression that the Pharisee stood where in the temple? Toward the front. It is implied because it says that the tax collector stood near the back or far away. And so we connect dots in our minds. And so by saying that the tax collector stood far away, it implies that the Pharisee stood near the front. Similarly, it doesn't say that the Pharisee raised his eyes to heaven, but because it points out that the tax collector would not even lift his eyes to heaven, it implies that the Pharisee stood praying, looking to heaven in all of his self-righteousness. The Pharisee, was the Pharisee aware of those around him? I know I'm asking you to draw on something from last week, but was the Pharisee aware of those around him when he prayed? We know he was because when he thanked God for all the people that he's not like or that he's better than, he even singled out the tax collector. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like all of these people, even like this despicable, horrible tax collector that's somewhere behind me. So the point is, the Pharisee prays, and he's totally aware of all the people who are around him. The tax collector, he's not comparing himself to anyone. If he did, he probably thought he was worse than all the people around him. But if you want to see the most significant and dramatic difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector, it is contained in verse 14. Go ahead and look there with me. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. Can you get a bigger difference than this? Can you get a bigger difference between two people than one being justified and one not? You can't. Because to say that one person is justified and to say that one is not is to say that one is going to heaven and one is going to hell. It's to say that one is experiencing blessing for all eternity and one is experiencing torment for all eternity. So what we just read in verse 14 could not be a bigger difference between two people. He goes on, Jesus does, and he says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And if we pause there, this is the Pharisee. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. This is the Pharisee, and it is everyone else like him who would pray, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Now, his pride is nauseating to us, but there are ways that we can be like this when we're puffed up, we're proud of our religious activity. We compare ourselves to others and see ourselves being better than them. So there are definitely ways we can be like the Pharisee. This phrase, exalts himself, ties back to the beginning of the parable. It is synonymous with the phrase in verse 9, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So to trust in yourself that you're righteous is to exalt yourself. And then he goes on in verse 14 and finishes by saying, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And this, of course, refers to the tax collector and everyone like the tax collector who would pray what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. People who will pray that sincerely will find themselves exalted. 
I've said numerous times that when God wants to make sure we don't miss something, he repeats it in Scripture, and this verse communicates one of the most repeated truths in Scripture. This verse in particular, that God gives grace to the humble or he exalts the humble. Proverbs 3.34, to the humble he gives favor or grace. James 4.6, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, both state, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So it's pretty evident that God wants us to learn the truth contained here in verse 14 because he writes us so many times throughout scripture old and new testament alike and i could have elaborated on this because we see it portrayed in individuals lives do you remember adonijah david's son what did he do he it actually says i think it's first kings 1 5 he exalted himself to be the next king and what did god do with him tore him down and humbled him so we see different accounts of this verse being poured, played out in people's lives we know justified justified means what oh man i thought we did know it justified, justified means justification is the act by which god declares wretched horrible sinners like us yes us righteous by grace through faith in christ romans 3 28 a man is justified by faith apart from the law romans 5 1 having been justified by faith galatians 2 16 a person is not justified or declared righteous by the works of the law but by faith in christ now this is the great paradox this is the greatest paradox in scripture to say something is the greatest paradox, to say to say something is the greatest paradox in scripture is to say that it's the greatest paradox in history and this is the paradox now what what's a paradox a paradox is something that seems absurd or contradictory yet remains true and the great paradox is this people who justify themselves like the pharisee and declare their righteousness will not be declared righteous people who pray god be merciful to me a sinner like the tax collector and declare their unrighteousness will be justified or declared righteous i believe that i've told you this once before i'm sorry i'm re repeating myself possibly in some parts of this parable but i believe i probably shared with you in the past that when i read this parable for the first time i really loved it but i reached the end of it and i just didn't like the way that it was worded <laughs> i was reading this and i thought why does it say that the tax collector went home justified i thought it was going to say that the tax collector went home forgiven i mean he is this terrible sinner what he seems to need more than anything else is forgiveness i'd grown up in the catholic church you go to the confessional to be forgiven this guy's wretched so he needs to be forgiven for his sins and instead i read that he's justified well what does that mean does that mean he wasn't forgiven the reason that I was so confused was because I did not understand at that time that justification is even greater than forgiveness. If you have the choice between being forgiven and justified, you choose justification. This brings us to lesson one. Justification is receiving forgiveness and righteousness. Justification is receiving forgiveness and righteousness. now even after i had been a christian for some time the situation did not improve for me i mean the situation regarding my understanding of justification because i heard people say this justification means just as if i had never sinned and maybe you've said that before i can remember saying that to my dad when i was trying to help him understand the gospel uh, or to understand we're saved by grace through faith versus being saved by works as the catholic catholic church taught and so i've said that too but there's a problem with saying that justification means just as if i'd never sinned let's just say like this it's not doing justice to justification it is short changing it it's only discussing half of what justification does for us the other half isn't just that were forgiven or just as if i'd never sinned but also just as if i had done all the very righteous things christ himself had done because i am given his righteousness this is known as double imputation 
double imputation where our sins are imputed to Christ's account. We are perfectly, completely forgiven, but his righteousness is imputed to our account. We are perfectly or completely righteous. It is the most unfair but also the most beautiful transaction in history. John Piper said, justification goes beyond forgiveness. Not only are we forgiven, but God also declares us righteous because of Christ. Christ bears our punishment and Christ performs our righteousness. And when we receive Christ, all his punishment and all of his righteousness is counted as ours. That doesn't mean we receive his punishment like we're punished like he's punished. It's just to say that we receive his punishment as though our sins have been punished because he took the punishment for them. Now think about this. If Jesus forgave our sins, but he did not give us his righteousness, what would we be? Well, we would be forgiven, and that's good. Or we would be innocent, and that's good. But we wouldn't be righteous, because to be righteous, you must do good or righteous things. The clearest example of this in Scripture is Adam and Eve. Sometimes it's not, it's not semantics. I mean, it's not a huge error, but you'll hear people say things like this. Well, Adam and Eve were created perfect. Well, in Scripture, perfect means coming to completion. It is not correct to say that Adam and Eve were created perfect or perfectly. It's called the age or dispensation of innocence because Adam and Eve were innocent. But they weren't perfect because if they were perfect, they would be both innocent and righteous. But Adam and Eve could not be declared perfect or righteous yet because they hadn't done any righteous things. They hadn't done anything. They were just created. For Adam and Eve to be righteous, they would have to engage in righteous behavior. To be perfect, they would have to engage in righteous behavior and not engage in any sinful behavior or to remain innocent as well. Jerry Bridges said, to be justified means more than to be declared not guilty It means to be declared righteous before God. It means God has imputed or charged the guilt of our sin to his son and imputed or credited Christ's righteousness to us. Now, and I I just want to say something to you. I didn't have this in my notes, but I was reflecting on this. You should never tire of hearing this. You should not be sitting here this morning saying, well, this is so foundational or this is so basic or this is just the gospel. I don't want to hear about the gospel again. This should always be an incredibly refreshing and wonderful message to have wash over us. We should always be blessed to be reminded, and I suspect for many of you these are reminders. I suspect for many of you I'm probably not sharing anything that you don't already know, but you should be blessed to be reminded of all of the, one time to be reminded of all these wonderful truths i don't know if i told you this before but one time i was at this pastor's conference and i didn't know who the speaker was but a lot of the people during the lunchtime were talking about this this great speaker who's going to come out and i don't even remember his name i hadn't even heard of him so i'm really excited to hear this man come out or hear from this man after he comes out and i'm not joking he he looked like he's about 150 years old and he comes out, and I'm, so, I'm not joking, I was almost concerned about whether he's going to make it up to the pulpit. So he makes it up to the pulpit, and he's like leaning on it like this. And I thought, and then I thought, I'm not sure if he's going to make it through his message. And so then he starts to preach, and he delivers the simplest message that I can remember hearing at a conference. And it was basically just him explaining the gospel to us and how double imputation works. And I thought, here's this man that looks like he's been a pastor for about 90 years. He comes out to address a bunch of other pastors, and this is what, of all things, he decides to share with us the truths of the gospel. And it was a really wonderful thing to hear from a man who had ministered all these decades and still loved more than anything else to just share the truths of what Christ had done for him and for us. And so I hope it would never be something that we would tire of of hearing. Now, if we understand this, it also helps us understand one of the more confusing accounts in the Gospels, which is Jesus being baptized. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know I was confused by Jesus being baptized for many years. It was confusing to me. 
Why would Jesus have to be baptized by John? It is a baptism of repentance. Jesus doesn't have to be baptized for anything or repent of anything. I don't want to say he doesn't have to be baptized for anything. He doesn't have to repent of anything, so why is he going to come out to be baptized or receive the baptism of repentance? Well, apparently it's not just confusing to me because who else was confused by it? John the Baptist was. Because when Jesus came out to be baptized, what did John say? Oh, I've been waiting for you. This makes a lot of sense. Hey, let him come to the front of the line. Let's get Jesus baptized. What did John say? Uh, no. I'll read it to you. Matthew 3, 13, Jesus came to be baptized by John. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So John thought it'd be the other way around. Verse 15, Jesus answered him. He said, let it be so now. Listen to this. It's important. Jesus says, let it be so now for me to be baptized by you, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented and baptized John. Now we're justified or declared righteous, given the perfect righteousness of Christ, but for Christ to give us a perfect righteousness, what did he have to have? A perfect righteousness which is to say he had to do all righteous things that a perfectly righteous person would do, including even being baptized, so he could fulfill all righteousness and then give us that fulfilled or perfect righteousness. Now back to the tax collector. This is a man who embodies the language of the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now this tax collector is incredibly poor in spirit which is to say he recognized his spiritual poverty he knew that he did not have the required righteousness to go to heaven yet jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like him matthew 5 6 another beatitude blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied they hunger and thirst for righteousness because they know that they don't have it they will receive the kingdom because they're looking for a righteousness that's outside themselves. They know they're not righteous enough to go to heaven, which is why they will go to heaven, because they will look for a righteousness that's available by faith in Christ. Now look back at the tax collector's words at the end of verse 13. He says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And I want to share something interesting with you. The words be merciful, two words in English, but only one word in Greek, and it's the word heloskemai, heloskemai. This is the Greek word for propitiation. Now, if you write in your Bible, I want to ask you to do something. Circle the words be merciful, draw a little line, and write the word propitiation. In fact, the NASB, and I know the Carl and Audrey are super thrilled to hear this since they use the NASB, has a footnote that even says the words be merciful means propitiation or propitious. And so the words be merciful, it's the same Greek word for propitiation. Now let's just talk about what propitiation is. Actually, this brings us to lesson two. I forgot I made it a lesson. <laughs> lesson two, propitiation turns away the wrath of an offended person. Propitiation turns away the wrath of an offended person. The word propitiation, an uncommon word, sadly some Bibles are getting rid of this word and using words that fall short of the actual word propitiation. The closest English words would be appease or pacify or placate, but these synonyms don't do justice to the word propitiate or propitiation. I'm going to try to illustrate propitiation with a few Old Testament accounts. So you don't have to turn there because I'm going to go through these quickly, but take your minds to Achan for a moment. Eight, so the Jews or the Israelites are told not to take any of the accursed things from Jericho. Achan took some of the accursed things from Jericho. They destroy the city, and then you can tell that there is an offended individual, and that individual is God. Or you can tell that God's wrath is against Israel because they leave Jericho and they go out against a small settlement. So they, de they defeat this invincible, impregnable city, Jericho, and then they go out and they lose at this small settlement called Ai. And Joshua recognizes something's wrong here. 
He goes to the Lord, and the Lord makes clear that his wrath is against Israel because of Achan's sin. So Achan is judged, and then listen to what happened. Joshua 7, 26. Israel raised over Achan a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. The Lord's wrath was turned away from Israel. And so there's a sense in which Achan almost serving as a picture or type of Christ, although obviously he's not the innocent sufferer that Jesus was, but once he's sacrificed for sin, then the wrath of God is turned away from the people. One of the most dramatic examples of propitiation occurred when God's wrath was against Israel because Saul slaughtered the Gibeonites and broke that long-standing covenant that Israel had made with the Gibeonites when they disguised themselves back in Joshua's day. Saul, in his zealousness, goes and slaughters a bunch of these people that the Israelites were supposed to protect. Now listen to this. 2 Samuel 21.3, David says to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? Now when David, and how shall I make atonement? In other words, it's as though David is saying, how can your wrath be turned away from us? What do I have to do to make up for what Saul did to your people? The Gibeonites said to him, let seven of Saul's sons be given to us so that we may hang them before the Lord. And David said, I will give them. They kill seven of Saul's descendants, and then after that, God, it says, 2 Samuel 21, 14, after that, God responded to the plea for the land. So these seven descendants of Saul, almost serving like Achan as pictures or types of Christ. And here's the thing. This is a super troubling account. Just follow me for a moment. Give me your attention. If you've read 2 Samuel 21, and you see Saul's descendants having to die for Saul's sins, you're troubled by it. You don't like it. It seems unfair. But let me tell you this. You can't have a picture or type of the gospel without unfairness. Because if you want the gospel, you've got to have unfairness. You've got to have the innocent dying for the wicked. Because if you don't have that, you don't have the gospel. So the fact that you find this account unfair when you read it on your own only serves to make it a more dramatic picture or type of the gospel. If the people that died were wicked, then it wouldn't look as much like the gospel because they would not look as much like Christ. Now, the last example, my personal favorite, the Philistines capture the ark. And, and so just to be clear, in all of these examples, I just want you to see that there's a turning away of the wrath of an offended individual, often after that there's some sacrifice that ends up absorbing the wrath of that offended individual. With Achan, it happened to be Achan, and with Saul, it happened to be seven of his descendants. Now, in this situation, the Philistines have captured the ark. They consider it to be this incredible victory over God, and then they take the ark, they bring it into the temple of their false god, Dagon, and they put the ark before Dagon to make it look as though God is bowing down to Dagon, and then during the night, God knocks Dagon off of his statue. The Philistines come in the next morning, put Dagon back up there, kind of brush him off, the next night, he falls off, and this time his arms and I believe his head even fell off. And then the Israelites or the Philistines realize something's wrong, and it got even worse because God began afflicting the Philistines with rats and tumors wherever the ark was located. And so the Philistines start moving the ark around to all these different cities because nobody wants it, and then finally it's so bad that they just decide to send the ark back to Israel. They thought they wanted it so badly at the beginning, but now things have become so bad for them, they say, We're, we got to get rid of it. Nobody wants it anymore. We keep suffering. Let's send the ark back to Israel, but we can't send it back without a gift. We've got to provide an offering. And that brings us to 1 Samuel 6, 3. They said, if you send away the ark back to Israel, do not go empty-handed or do not send it empty. By all means, return with a guilt offering and then you'll be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And that right there, that's propitiation. They're trying to get God's hand or wrath to turn away from them. They have the ark. They know they shouldn't. They know God's wrath is against them. They want to give an offering that will turn away God's wrath. And they said, so you must make images. Listen to this. This is outrageous, but it's what it says. You must make images of your tumors, 
and images of the rats that have been ravaging the land, and then perhaps God will lighten his hand from off you, or in other words, turn his wrath from you. And that's the heart of propitiation, lightening the hand of an offended person. Now, they thought that images of their tumors and their rats were going to accomplish the trick. Now, we read that, and it's like, this is like, oh, this is just crazy. How could the Philistines think that golden images of rats and tumors are going to turn away the wrath of God? But this is not a far cry from any works-based religion. In fact, it is a perfect picture of every works-based religion. Because every works-based religion is man's efforts to appease God, man's efforts to turn away God's wrath, man's efforts to make up for his sins. You could say that every single works-based religion is about man's efforts at propitiating or turning away the wrath. And whether you try to do it with golden tumors, golden rats, or any other human effort, it's no different. Okay, now I shared all that with you because I want to share something beautiful with you. In the New Testament, whenever propitiation is discussed, it always refers to God's work for us and never our work for God. In other words, whenever propitiation is discussed in the Bible, it is never about what we do for God It is always about what he has done for us through Christ. Just a few examples, or actually four verses, and I think it's all the verses that mention it, propitiation. Romans 3.25, God set forth Jesus as a propitiation. Hebrews 2.17, in all things he had to be made like his brethren to make propitiation for the sins of the people. 1 John 2.2, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.10, God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So here's my point. Whenever the Bible talks about propitiation, it always causes us to celebrate not what we do for the Lord, but what Christ has done for us. Because you can take all the gold tumors and rats, and God's not going to be satisfied. You can take all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, God's not going to be satisfied. You can take all your best works, you can take all the best works of all the best people you know, and God's not going to be satisfied. There is no gift or sacrifice or service that man can offer that can satisfy God. There's only one thing that has ever sacrificed God or satisfied God, and that is Christ being sacrificed. God looks at that and says, this satisfies me. Just listen to it described in Isaiah 53. I'm going to substitute pronouns so we know exactly who we're talking about. But Isaiah 53, 11, Out of the anguish of Jesus' soul, God shall see and be satisfied. So God was able to look at that horrendous sacrifice his son made in our place and say, that satisfies me. That turns away my wrath. That's why we sing in Christ alone, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That's what we're singing about, propitiation. God needs an object for his wrath against our sin. God's wrath cannot just be left lingering out there. In other words, God's wrath can't be turned away from us without finding some object to be placed upon. And so there are only two choices with God's wrath. It it either rests on us because of our sin, or it rests on Christ who takes that punishment that our sins deserve. When Christ is that object of God's wrath, his wrath can be turned away from us. Now, to connect this back to the tax collector, you say, oh, Pastor Scott, okay, this makes, this is, you know, wonderful to hear about propitiation, makes a lot of sense, but what does it have to do with a tax collector? He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful as propitiation. So he said, God, turn away your wrath from me, a sinner. And God did. Look at Luke 18, 14 again. I tell you, this man went down to his house 
justified rather than the other. His justification was immediate. It was complete. He left the temple justified. It wasn't a process. It's not sanctification. There was nothing to earn it or warrant it or to deserve it. But I want to get you to think about something along those lines. This is the New Testament, but Jesus has not instituted the new covenant yet. The new covenant was instituted at the Last Supper, which we haven't reached yet. So even though we're in the New Testament, we're still under the old covenant. So what should this man have done? What should this man have done for all of his terrible sin? Should offer sacrifices. Probably lots of them, if he's as terrible as he looks. Now I am going to ask you a trick question, another trick question. You get two of them in this sermon. Did the tax collector offer any sacrifices? See, I told you it's a trick question. You don't even want to answer. <laughs> turn to Psalm 51 for the answer. We won't turn back to Luke. And keep the question in mind, did the tax collector offer any sacrifices for his sins? Keep that in mind while we turn here. Many of the Psalms have descriptions at the beginning. The description of Psalm 51, which your Bible probably contains at the beginning, a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he sinned with Bathsheba. Many of you probably know that this Psalm, along with Psalm 32, are David's two dramatic psalms of repentance that he wrote after Nathan confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband Uriah. And I'll, and I'll just say this. If you ever feel particularly overwhelmed by your sin, or you're ever counseling someone who feels particularly overwhelmed by their sin, send them to Psalm 51 or to Psalm 32. These are the psalms of repentance. Now, in this psalm, David describes losing almost everything. We don't have time to look at all of it, but he talks about losing his purity, his joy, his witness, his wisdom, his peace. He even reached the point that he was afraid of losing God's spirit. Look in verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. This sounds kind of foreign to us because we know we can't lose our salvation or be unsealed by the Holy Spirit or be regenerated and then unregenerated. But why would David talk about losing God's spirit? Because that's exactly what happened to his predecessor or that's exactly what happened to the king before him, Saul. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Samuel anointed David. The spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. It's not the same indwelling or regenerative work that occurs with new testament believers it was the holy spirit coming upon david but then what happened for the holy spirit to come upon david it first departed from saul the very next verse the spirit of the lord departed from saul and a harmful spirit from the lord tormented him so up to this point david has never seen a king keep god's spirit through his reign David knows that if you sin badly enough, you can lose God's spirit because that's what happened with Saul. And, and I'll be honest, this is probably what David's doing. He's saying, Saul lost God's spirit because he offered a sacrifice in 1 Samuel 13 that Samuel was supposed to offer. And then in 1 Samuel 15, he didn't slaughter all the Amalekites. I committed adultery and murder. Who looks worse? Just be honest, who looks worse? David looks much worse than Saul. It was very reasonable for David to expect the same thing to happen in terms of losing God's spirit. Now look at verse 16, Psalm 51, verse 16. You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Now what is this all about? This verse would make tons of sense if we were reading it in one of Paul's epistles or any New Testament epistle. Because then Jesus' sacrifice has replaced all the sacrifices. But this is Old Testament. And we know when you sin, especially when you sin as badly as David did, you offer sacrifices. In fact, David should have offered a bunch of sacrifices. But David said that God 
would not delight in them or be pleased with them. And this brings us to lesson three, part one. God didn't want physical sacrifices. God didn't want physical sacrifices. Now you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, Pastor Scott, maybe this is an outlier. This is an exception. There's just this one time that this happened where someone declares that God wouldn't be pleased with sacrifices. No, this is a theme. I was going over the sermon with Katie and she brutally made me remove lots of the verses I wanted to give you demonstrating the theme that this is, but I'll give you just a few of them. Psalm 40 verse 6, in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Jeremiah 6 20, your burnt offerings, God says your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices are not pleasing to me. Malachi 1.10, I wish one among you would, listen, this is crazy. God, okay, this is Malachi. Malachi is a post-exilic prophet, and let me make it simple. Malachi was a prophet after the Jews returned from exile and rebuilt the temple. Or in other words, Malachi is one of the prophets who ministered to the Jews right after they rebuilt the temple, which God commanded. And then Malachi says this, I, God says through Malachi, I wish one person would shut the temple doors because I will not accept any offering from your hand. That's wild. Why would God say this repeatedly throughout his Old Testament? There's three reasons. First, and most obviously, animal sacrifices are typically associated with sin. Although God commanded them, what was his greater desire? That people would... Okay, let's try it again. Animal sacrifices are offered for sin. So what would God want more than animal sacrifices? He would want obedience. Think of what Samuel told Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Now Samuel, who said this to Saul, was a Levite. He was a priest. He was raised in the temple under Eli, the great high priest. Samuel is one of the most respected priests in the Old Testament. He was not criticizing the sacrificial system that God instituted. He was just saying that God wants obedience more than sacrifices. And you know this if you're a parent. You appreciate your children apologizing, but you wish that they had simply <laughs> obeyed in the first place. Jeremiah 7.22, And that day I brought Israel out of Egypt. I did not command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this is the command I gave them obey my voice, I'll be your God, you shall be my people. So the point is God wanted obedience more than sacrifices, and he still does today. The second reason that God condemned animal sacrifices is their outward actions that can be performed without the inward matching or being engaged. Their religious activities that can be executed without the right heart. Or if I said it really simple, animal sacrifices can be offered by people simply going through the motions, which isn't much different than the situation for us going to church, receiving communion, or singing the songs. God doesn't want things done simply outwardly. He wants the outward to reflect the inward. And if you think of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee is a great example of having everything going on outwardly. I, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. His outward looked great. His inward looked ugly, which is why we know in Matthew 23, there's that incredibly strong condemnation of the religious leaders looking great outwardly, like tombs that are sparkling, but inwardly rotting people's bodies are there, cleaning the outside of the dish. The inward is ugly. That's the Pharisee. The third reason that God condemned animal sacrifices, and this is the most important reason, is even in the Old Testament, animal sacrifices could not take away sin. Hebrews 10.4, I think it's Hebrews 10.11, says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. I mean, we contrast that. 
You contrast Hebrews 10, animal sacrifices cannot take away sin with John the Baptist's declaration when he sees Jesus. Jesus is the animal sacrifice or the Lamb of God who does what? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away sin. The contrast between Christ's sacrifice and its sufficiency with the insufficiency of the Old Testament sacrifices. Now, this leaves us pretty confused. If God doesn't want animal sacrifices, well, then what does he want? I'm glad you asked that because it's not that God doesn't want sacrifices at all. Look at verse 17 to see the sacrifices that God wants. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God or the sacrifices he desires are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And this brings us to the next part of lesson three. God didn't want physical sacrifices part two as much as spiritual ones. God didn't want physical sacrifices as much as spiritual ones. These verses show that even under the law where God required animal sacrifices, which were outward and physical, he desired sacrifices that were inward and spiritual even more. A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And then it says, David says, O oh God, these sacrifices you will not despise. That's David's way of saying that this is how to be received or accepted by God. Now, to tie it back to the tax collector, the reason we're looking at Psalm 51 is these are the sacrifices that the tax collector offered. And so here's what's incredibly beautiful to me. What if the tax collector came with tons of bulls and rams and like we read in Micah 6, rivers flowing with oil and, and just heaping it on God, all these sacrifices, oh God, you can have all this. God didn't want that. He didn't want those physical sacrifices. He wanted the spiritual ones. And this is what allowed the tax collector to be justified. It was the tax collector not offering bulls and rams, but simply saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, I want to conclude by asking you to consider what Jesus taught in this parable. I don't want us to take it for granted or lose significance associated with how truly great this is. You have a tax collector. I know, I, and I don't know if we're getting late or if it's getting late or not. I don't know if I've been preaching too long. I'm just going to pretend like I haven't been. Stay with me for this. Picture the tax collector, the most hated, despised, understood to be sinful person imaginable. He goes down to his house justified or declared righteous by God. That is a truly beautiful reality for us. The sobering reality is the Pharisee, the most righteous, respected man that Jesus could portray, probably looking outwardly perfect, was not justified. In fact, he was declared unrighteous by God. Now, can you imagine, I want you to consider how this sounded to two groups. Can you imagine how this parable sounded to the proud religious leaders who were, as Jesus said in Luke 18, 9, trusting in themselves that they were righteous? There were two things the proud religious leaders thought when Jesus preached this parable. First, it is outrageous. This is scandalous. And the second thing they thought was, I hate Jesus. I despise you, Jesus, for preaching something like this. The, the Pharisees probably could have wanted to crucify Jesus just for this parable alone. It sounded so offensive to them. He called them out in front of everyone with this parable. But now let me ask you this. Can you imagine how wonderful this parable sounded to any humble, broken, contrite tax collectors or harlots or murderers or adulterers that were listening. I think it would have sounded like the greatest message ever told, which is what the gospel is. So wretched sinners like us, and just take this with you, be blessed by this, but keep this parable with you, my responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You should be doing the work of the ministry. And when you encounter those people who feel like this tax collector, broken over their sin, God can never forgive me for what I've done, 
bring them to this parable and tell them tax collectors were the worst, man. Everyone despised them. Absolutely despicable. You know, the roaches under your refrigerator look better than them kind of stuff. Show them this parable and then say, God declared that wretched sinner righteous by his faith in Christ. Wretched sinners like us can pray, God be merciful to, be, to me a sinner and be justified or declared righteous by God's grace through faith in Christ. If you have any questions about anything I shared in this morning's sermon, I'll be at front after service. I consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful parable, the representation of the gospel, how to be justified by faith. Let us be personally encouraged by it and let us remember it to share with others that we might counsel those other sinners that we would meet who look like that tax collector just broken over their sin feeling unworthy and not sure not sure where to turn help us to be able to bring them to these verses and encourage them by the gospel's truth and we pray this in jesus name amen